Hi, it's Katrina. The Merovingians. The Merovingian dynasty was a family of Frankish kings who ruled over Dark Age Europe in the 5th century. They were also known as the Long-Haired Kings because of the tradition they had of keeping their hair long and flowing like romance novel heroes or elven kings. Or you know, like Legolas in Lord of the Rings. Anyway, I digress. If you've never heard of the Merovingians, you aren't alone. Though they played a major role in reshaping Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire, they disappeared after 250 years, when they were usurped by the Carolingian dynasty, whose most famous ruler was Charlemagne. But the small role of the Merovingians in global history isn't the only reason you haven't heard of them. There are some rumors that powerful forces out there, including the Vatican, would prefer you never heard of these people. This is because they identified themselves as the direct descendants of Jesus Christ. According to the Merovingians, they were the rightful kings of the world. They believed that Jesus Christ escaped his crucifixion and fled to what is now modern France, previously the kingdom of Francia. But he didn't escape alone. He went on the run with Mary Magdalene. The two settled there, had children, and those descendants allegedly went on to become the powerful Merovingian kings. We of course have no proof that this is true. We do have historical records of the various Frankish kings who apparently shared the blood of Jesus in their veins. But 1,500 years later, it's impossible for anyone to truly know the bloodline of the ancient kings. What do you think of this controversial claim? Too close to the Da Vinci Code, or do you think it's possible? The Dark History of Valentine's Day Love it or hate it, Valentine's Day is widely regarded as the most romantic day of the year. But the history behind this candy and romance-fueled greeting card holiday is dark and foreboding. Although nobody has been able to pinpoint the exact origin of Valentine's Day, the very first time it was ever celebrated, we do know where it started. From February 13th to February 15th, ancient Romans celebrated Lupercalia. It wasn't celebrated with giving chocolates to your partner or going to a romantic dinner. That is the much more recent Victorian interpretation. No, in ancient Rome it was a pagan holiday fueled by fires, passion, violence, and animal sacrifice. It started with the sacrifice of goats and a dog in honor of the wolf mother who nursed Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. There were special priests who organized this festival known as the Luperci, who would dip their knives in blood and cut the skin off the animals, then go about hitting women who wanted to have children, as it was believed that by the skin touching them during this festival, they would become more fertile. According to religious studies professor Noel Lensky, the Romans were a bunch of depraved, intoxicated maniacs. But the fun didn't stop there. They also practiced a matchmaking lottery, where the men pulled names of women from a vessel. These couples would be matched up, regardless of if they wanted to or not, for the duration of the festival. The name Valentine comes from the execution of a priest on February 14th in the 3rd century. This man was honored by the Catholic Church as a martyr, but there were several other Christian martyrs also called Valentine. In the 5th century, when the Roman Empire was Christian, a pope ordered the festival of Lupercalia to be banned, and instead would be honored in a more somber, orderly way under the name of St. Valentine's Day. The Buried City of Selinunte Something happened 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece that you probably haven't been taught in history class. It was one of the greatest tragedies of ancient times, and it happened in what is now Sicily. Archaeologists recently dug up the buried city of Selinunte, where they say the local inhabitants were slaughtered, and whoever survived was taken as a slave by invaders from North Africa in the 5th century BC. Historians have known about what happened here for a long time, but it wasn't until recently that archaeologists were able to see the evidence with their own eyes. After the people of Selinunte were slaughtered or taken away, the city was largely abandoned. It then became buried over thousands of years as sand covered the buildings and they slowly sank into the earth. The city was once prosperous and flourishing. There was a nice harbor, an industrial zone, and residential neighborhoods. But that all changed when African troops from Carthage, what is now modern Tunisia, invaded the city and butchered 16,000 Greeks. The attack was unannounced, unprompted, and totally unnecessary. Women and children were cut down in the streets. An estimated 5,000 men were taken as slaves, with many thousands of women and children as well. One day the city was bustling and vibrant, and the next day it was a ghost town. The Nephilim 
In the book of Genesis, it is described how God created heaven and earth, how Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and how Noah survived the great flood with a boat full of animals. It also tells about the fallen angels known as Nephilim. The book of Genesis claims that when these angels fell from heaven, they wandered the earth as giants. The entire story is in just three verses, and yet it has had such profound consequences throughout history. People have always wondered where these Nephilim may have gone if they really did walk the earth. And if they were real creatures, does that mean that giants actually existed? There's no possible way to answer this, but there is a piece of the story you may not have heard before. While the Nephilim in Genesis were only mentioned briefly and their purpose vague at best, Jewish writers really liked the idea. In the text we know as the Book of Enoch, likely written in the 2nd century AD, the story was improved. There was added a tale of 200 angels who plotted to steal the most beautiful wives from the humans. They were called the Watchers, and their desire for human women corrupted the world. After they stole the women, God cast them out of heaven and they became the Nephilim. They were evil and corrupted all of mankind, teaching women charms and enchantments and turning them into witches. They also taught the men how to use metal to create swords and knives for war. What started as just three lines in Genesis was escalated to an entirely different proportion in the Book of Enoch. The Lizard People Apparently there are lizard people living underground in California. At least that's what the local legend and folklore of Los Angeles County says. The story of the lizard people underneath Los Angeles goes back 5,000 years to the ancient Hopi people. They claimed that a race of lizard people built three giant underground cities along the Pacific coast. One was beneath LA and the locations of the others were unknown. The cities were apparently built as protection against terrible fires raging on the surface. The entirety of California found itself engulfed in fire, and so the lizard people retreated underground. But here's where the story gets confusing. According to the Hopi legend, these people weren't actually lizards as in reptilians. They were people who worshipped a lizard. This explains why they had such an affinity with building subterranean cities. Throughout the years, the interpretation of the story has changed dramatically. It went from a race of indigenous people who revered lizards to a literal race of lizard-human hybrids. Sadly, no underground city has ever actually been found. Mining engineer George Shufield searched for it in 1933 and apparently found a shaft that went 350 feet beneath the city, but he had to give up his efforts of locating the subterranean structures after a terrible cave-in. After he died in 1957, no one else went looking for them. Do you think there might be an ancient city under LA? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. The Bloodthirsty Carthaginians Archaeologists have come across overwhelming evidence that the ancient civilization of Carthage, in what is now North Africa, practiced something atrocious. What's truly amazing about the discovery is that for decades, scholars have adamantly denied that the Carthaginians did this. And yet now, researchers from Oxford University have confirmed that parents in ancient Carthage sacrificed their own children as offerings to the gods. There are ancient accounts by the Romans and Greeks that say the Carthaginians killed their own children. It was just something people knew up until around the 1970s. That was when scholars argued against the theory, citing it as racist propaganda. They said it was something that Greeks and Romans said to slander the Carthaginians. But based on evidence found in cemeteries throughout Carthage, as well as Sicily, Sardinia, and Malta, it really did happen. When children were only a few weeks old, they were taken to these locations, called tophets, sacrificed and then cremated. The evidence comes from the discovery of both animal sacrifices in the same area and the inscriptions above the slain infants that indicated the parents' prayers asking for blessings, and it was all so the parents could be blessed by the gods. The Secret Revelations of Jesus In an ancient Egyptian trash dump, archaeologists found what they believed to be the secret revelations of Jesus. The document is a rare manuscript discovered amongst piles of ancient tax receipts and bills of sales for donkeys from the 5th century. It's actually a manuscript from the New Testament that never actually made it into the Bible, called the First Apocalypse of James. But it's not the only time a copy of this has been found. The only other version was found in the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt back in 1945, buried in jars underneath the ground. The text was likely stashed there around the year 367, 
after the Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, decided which 27 books would be put into the New Testament. This particular story was deemed too heretical to be put into the Bible. It's another great example of how the stories in the great book were chosen for inclusion or discarded by powerful people long ago. This story is considered a forbidden text because of the way it portrays Jesus. Whoever wrote it described Jesus as more of a normal human than a messiah. It's said in the text that Jesus taught people the world they were living in was a prison created by an evil god, as if they were living in some kind of terrible matrix. He said the world was guarded by demonic figures he called archons, and that the only way past these demons and into the afterlife was with special passwords. You can probably see why this story never made it into the official Bible. Royal Eunuchs In Imperial China, the emperor kept a huge harem of women. We already know that the ancient rulers of China had large groups of kept women at their disposal for both pleasure and procreation. But what a lot of people don't know is that there was a hierarchy inside every emperor's harem. The lady on top was the official wife or the empress. Then there were the consorts, higher ranking women but with no real power. The ones on the bottom were concubines. During the Ming dynasty between 1368 and 1644, Every emperor held a ceremony in the Forbidden City, in which he would choose all his favorite girls aged between 14 and 16. These girls were basically slaves. And now we're getting to the part that may surprise you. The emperor also had a small army of eunuchs to take care of his hundreds and hundreds of female slaves. Because ordinary men were not allowed anywhere near them, the emperor would have thousands of servants be castrated so that they held no threat to his treasured consorts and concubines. They would live in the harem, taking care of everyone's needs. But that wasn't all of it. Concubines met a very tragic fate whenever the emperor died. He could have hundreds of them at any given time, but when he passed away, they were all rounded up and sacrificed, usually buried alive, so that they could pleasure the emperor in the afterlife. Devil Worship in the Middle Ages In the Middle Ages, serious witch hunts began. The church launched the Inquisition, and women all throughout Europe were targeted as Satan worshippers and evil sorceresses. And while you are probably familiar with many of the atrocities committed by the church to combat what they saw as the brides of the devil, there is one piece of history you might not know. Scholars believe the whole idea of devil worship may have been fabricated by the church itself. After the disintegration of Rome and pagan ideology, Christianity swept across Europe but it likely didn't penetrate some of the more rural areas for hundreds of years, where pagan religions continued unhindered. Plus, Christianity was typically practiced at the same time as many of the older religions. There were even hybrid religions such as dualism that mixed Christianity with the belief in more natural deities. Obviously, the church didn't like this. It's been suggested that in order to have Christianity fully adopted by every last citizen in Europe, they created a common villain. To control pockets of people they viewed as heretics, and to maintain their control, they came up with devil worship. They accused people, hunted down people they said were involved, and through these efforts, paganism was completely abolished. The church cemented their influence over the land, their influence lasting even today. The Necronomicon The Necronomicon is arguably the most nefarious book ever, but it never existed. This book was created by H.P. Lovecraft in his stories of cosmic terror. It then became even more famous when it was used in the Evil Dead movie to summon terrible demons. But fortunately for all of us, no such book has ever existed. But there are some forbidden texts from medieval Europe that were said to do the same things as the Necronomicon. For example, the Grand Grimoire is a book of black magic that's been dated back as far as 1421. Some scholars believe it was written in the 19th century as a hoax, but nobody really knows. It definitely couldn't have been published later than 1701. In any case, it contains ancient writings as old as King Solomon. Within the book are instructions on how to summon Lucifer, how to strike a deal with the devil, and how to bend lesser demons to do one's bidding. Unlike the Necronomicon, this is a very real book that you can use to try and summon demons. It's hopefully not going to work, but all the instructions are there anyway. Fish with hands. A strange fish with hands has been spotted by scientists in Australia. The scientists who found this bizarre creature compared seeing this unusual sea dweller to finding a needle in a haystack. It's called the pink handfish, 
and it looks like any other fish except that it scuttles around on the seafloor using its bright red hands. The fish is so rare that it hadn't been seen in over 20 years. The most recent sighting came thanks to an underwater camera put beneath Tasman Fracture Marine Park. Researchers were thrilled when the camera picked up the handfish, the first one seen by human eyes since 1999. It's strange that the fish is so elusive considering it lives in shallow water. Scientists say it must be critically endangered, otherwise there would likely be more sightings of them. There may only be a handful of them left, crawling around on the seafloor off the coast of Australia and Tasmania at the depth of around 300 feet. And in case you were wondering, these creatures really do crawl. They look absolutely bizarre, with a pair of feet or hands on the bottom of their body and then some longer hands extending from the sides, off of what look like extremely stubby pink arms. Their bright red eyes, pink lips, unusual appendages, and dorsal fin make these rare and likely endangered fish look like some kind of Pokemon. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. An ancient sea screw. Back in the 1990s, something strange was found embedded in a piece of rock. It looks to be a perfectly preserved screw, practically fossilized. The strangest part about this particular discovery was that researchers supposedly managed to date the object to being somewhere near 300 million years old. There is no debating the shape of the object discovered in the rock. It clearly looked remarkably similar to a modern day screw, unlike anything found naturally in the world. This led people to speculate that there was a highly advanced human civilization hundreds of millions of years before humans evolved on Earth. Either that, or there were aliens living on the planet with their own technology back when humans were still in the distant future. No one knows the truth. The object has been a point of debate for nearly 30 years. The group in possession of the ancient screw isn't making things any clearer or easy to verify their claims. They haven't given the supposed screw to any other scientist for testing which has led experts to dismiss their claim as fake. Additionally, scientists have already come up with a different explanation. The best hypothesis put forward by experts who have seen the photos of the supposed screw is that it's actually an ancient creature. They say the screw shape is a marine creature called a crinoid. There are over 600 species of these creatures that are extinct right now, with several still alive today in our modern seas. They have changed a lot over the years, but have been around in more or less the same form since 440 million years ago. The fossilized screw looks identical to a fossilized crinoid. Glowing Snow Scientists were left baffled by the bizarre discovery of glowing snow in the Russian Arctic. Mikhail Naritin, the son of a molecular biologist, made the discovery while walking through the snow with his two dogs. This was near a remote field station on the White Sea coast. Much to his surprise, when he made a snowball, he found the snow would glow more brightly the harder he squeezed it. The more pressure, the brighter the snow. When he looked behind him, he saw that his footprints were glowing a vibrant blue. Even the dog's footprints were glowing. The boy ran to get his father and together they collected some snow and took it back to their laboratory at the field station. They then observed a sample as it defrosted under a microscope. What they found was that the snow was filled with aquatic organisms known as copepods. These are small crustaceans that can be found in both fresh and saltwater habitats. It wasn't actually the snow that was glowing, but the very tiny copepods. The glowing organisms were not a revelation since the species is known to glow in the ocean. The beautiful phenomenon can be seen along coasts all over the world, but it's never before been seen on land, never mind in the snow. This was the very first time the phenomenon was documented in the Arctic. Scientists have yet to figure out how the organisms made it from the sea into the Arctic snow and are still investigating. What would you do if you noticed that your snowball was glowing? Let me know in the comments. Underground Alien Structure UFO researchers believe they have just discovered an ancient underground alien structure hiding in Antarctica. They made the discovery by looking at satellite images of the continent via Google Earth. In the middle of the ice and snow, there appeared to be some kind of structure half excavated. Even more shocking is that when the researchers changed the time and looked at earlier satellite images, 
they saw that the alien-like structure was gone. Instead, there was an airport runway carved through the snow, dozens of trailers surrounding a large mound of ice, and what looked like scientific and military vehicles. Putting the pieces together, it really looks as if the military stumbled upon something extraordinary, maybe even extraterrestrial. They then brought in their equipment to excavate it, revealing an underground structure that had been buried for an undetermined amount of time. Either that, or they were building their very own military installation deep in Antarctica, where it would be hidden from prying eyes. Either way, it's a weird discovery that's only being talked about by fringe internet scientists. What do you think? Secret military installation? Alien discovery? Something else? Tell me your theories below! The Little Ice Age and the Great Dying Scientists have discovered new evidence regarding the Little Ice Age of the 1600s and the Great Dying of indigenous people in South America. It's been estimated that in the century after Europeans arrived in the Americas, over 50 million indigenous people died. They died as a result of slavery, warfare, and epidemics. This terrible part of history is called the Great Dying. In 2019, scientists in the UK proposed that in the areas of forest where the native people had been killed off, the forests regrew and helped cause a miniature ice age. Because the native people had cleared the land when the Europeans came and eradicated them, that land regrew as wild forest. The new trees then absorbed enough carbon for there to be a dip in the global atmospheric CO2 levels. This anomaly caused the entire world to get just a little colder in the 17th century. However, an even newer study done by Mark Bush from the Florida Institute of Technology and his colleagues have revealed that this might not be the case at all. They used radiocarbon dating to trace sediments from the bottoms of 39 lakes throughout the Amazon basin. They did find evidence of forest clearing and burning, and of regrowth, but they doubt that the amount of regrowth contributed to a dip in CO2. Rock art in the Scottish Highlands Strange stone carvings dating back hundreds of years have been found in the Scottish Highlands by an amateur archaeologist. The prehistoric artwork is located on the mountain of Ben Lars, but it's not the kind of art you're probably thinking of. There are no bizarre images of alien figures or curious hybrid animals. Instead, the art consists of cup and ring marks. Helen Cole from the National Trust of Scotland says the discovery is highly unusual because the rock has way more cup marks than normal, at least 90 on a single piece of stone. There are also some linear grooves, but no one is quite sure what those mean. Then again, what the artwork means is a mystery as well. It's similar to other pieces of prehistoric rock art found in the Scottish hills, all of which are a complete enigma. They all seem to show the same symbols, rings as if someone had laid cups all over the stones and their bottoms left ring marks. All the experts can say for sure is that the Scottish Highlands was a significant landscape in prehistory. It's just nobody knows why the ancient people from hundreds and thousands of years ago felt the need to imprint rings into every piece of rock they came across. A Strange Discovery at Petra A strange new discovery has been made at the ancient city of Petra. Archaeologists were shocked when they discovered evidence of white sandstone and the remains of this lost city. It was a surprise because the valley in which Petra was built is filled with nothing except red sandstone. They now believe the presence of the white stone is a hint as to how the powerful civilization declined and went extinct. Petra was built as a thriving hub for culture, politics, and economics by the Nabataeans. These were the dwellers of the desert in what is now modern Jordan and the gatekeepers of trade through the region. The Greeks were so jealous of the wealth being accumulated by the Nabataeans that they tried to take Petra in the year 312 BC, but they failed. When the Romans arrived centuries later in 106 AD, they did not fail. Petra was annexed, renamed Arabia Petraea, and the Romans took over the city for the next 250 years, while the Nabataean people were slowly erased. It was in the 4th century that a massive earthquake ripped the city of Petra apart and caused its importance to wane. It was also around this time that sea routes were becoming much more popular for trade, extinguishing the old Silk Road. But archaeologist Tom Paradise doesn't believe this is the whole story. He and his team uncovered beds of massive white sandstone in 2017. 
it didn't belong in the city. He believes that the mysterious chunks of stone are evidence that it wasn't just an earthquake that destroyed Petra, but a massive flood of over 20 feet. The white sandstone was brought from far away and swept through Petra on massive waves, ultimately sealing the fate of the city. The Vegetable Planet Astronomers have just discovered a planet with one of the strangest shapes ever seen. Rather than looking like a spherical globe, you know, like pretty much every planet, this one looks like a vegetable. An international team of astronomers working closely with the European Space Agency were on a mission to discover exoplanets when they found the vegetable planet. It's called WASP-103b. Believe it or not, it's bigger than the Sun and over one and a half times larger than Jupiter. It's 1,500 light years away from us, circling an F-type star. So what kind of vegetable does it look like? Scientists say the planet is shaped like a potato. The scientists believe that because of its close proximity to its home star, tidal stresses have pulled the planet in such a way that it morphed from its original marble shape into that of a potato. It's less than 20,000 miles away from its star, and so all that gravity has kind of yanked it into an oblong, vegetable-like shape. Galveston Island's Ghost Wolves In Texas, there is a population of strange canids that scientists believe could help revive the highly endangered red wolf. They live on Galveston Island, and these canids about the size of coyotes prowl the beach at night with their eyes gleaming in the darkness. If you look closely, you can see that the Galveston Island wolves are a little unusual. Their legs are too long, they have broad heads and pointed snouts, and their fur is distinctly red. They also have white patches on their muzzles. This is because these canids contain rare bits of DNA from red wolves, American wolves that were declared extinct back in the 1980s. Yes, there used to be wolves that were red, and they lived in Texas. The discovery of the Galveston Island wolves and their genetic past is thanks to local resident Ron Wooten. The wolves ran off with his dog back in 2008, and that was when he took an interest in the creatures. He began studying them when everyone else assumed they were simply pests and a danger to their own pets. He then reached out to scientists, believing he had stumbled upon something really fascinating. And it turned out he was right. These wolves are descendants of the extinct red wolves, although mixed heavily with coyotes. It's unclear yet if scientists can use their DNA to help bring back the red wolf, but it's the closest hope they have. Ancient Giants A strange discovery back in the 16th century convinced people living in London that giants were real. It was allegedly a leg bone, over 25 inches long. According to 16th century historian John Stowe, the locals all thought it was the shank bone of a human being, one of extraordinary size. There was a massive one on display at the Fair Parish Church of St. Lawrence. There was also another one on display at the Parish Church of St. Mary Aldermanbury. In truth, both of the giant leg bones came from a mammoth. But the local Londoners had no idea what a mammoth was in the 16th century and simply assumed the bones belonged to giants. Someone had dug them up from the dirt somewhere, brought them to the church, and it was declared the giants were real. It helped that there had been stories of giants for hundreds of years before the discoveries were made. On Ferdinand Magellan's voyage in 1520, he and his crew reported seeing giants on the beach when they landed in South America. It wasn't a huge stretch to believe that prehistoric giants had existed in London before humans showed up. Thanks for watching The Aztec Underworld. In Aztec mythology, those who died had to go through an intense journey down into the underworld. The underworld, known as Mictlan, had nine levels, similar to the nine circles of hell. But in Aztec mythology, everyone, both good and bad, had to take this journey. It lasted four years and was filled with dangerous obstacles. The objective was to eventually arrive at the heart of the underworld, where the soul of the departed could finally rest for eternity. Just like practically every culture, we definitely don't have any physical evidence that an Aztec underworld ever existed. But archaeologists have found plenty of examples in architecture and artwork throughout Mexico of the journey itself, in the spooky caves and tunnels underneath Aztec cities. The first step was to cross a river with the help of a dog that had a bright color so that it would help you see in the darkness. 
Even in death, our doggy friends are still helping us out. Most researchers believe the dog was inspired by the Mexican hairless dog that is still alive today. The next level was to travel across some ghostly mountains and follow a dangerous path of obsidian rock, which the Aztecs revered as blades used for human sacrifice. The fourth level was a place where the spirit had to stop and remember the saddest moment of their life. To get rid of the sadness, the spirit had to travel through miles and miles of snow to get to the middle of the journey. This was a place with such strong winds that most souls would get stuck. Those who weren't strong enough were blown away into oblivion. If you did manage to make it through, you would be met by a barrage of arrows raining down. And if you didn't get hit, you could continue on to reach the jaguar. This jaguar god would ask you to abandon any worldly things you might still have. The jaguar deprived the soul of its heart, so the soul had to be completely free of everything in order to travel on. Nearing the end, in the eighth stage, the soul would watch their entire life over again, and then finally they would meet Mictlan Tecutli, the god of the dead depicted as a blood-spattered skeleton with a headdress of owl feathers and a necklace of human eyeballs. And here is where the soul could finally rest. Not quite my version of peaceful, but hey! Trash Tombs Just about 2,000 years ago, the Roman city of Pompeii had a trash problem. Even before it was buried by volcanic ash in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii was kind of a mess, particularly the tombs of Pompeii. Archaeologists have discovered trash littering the floors of multiple tombs, so much so that it was obviously a huge problem. The litter includes animal bones, pieces of broken pottery, smashed bricks, and dirty old charcoal. The mystery here is that scientists have been trying to figure out why the ancient Romans were using tombs where their dead were laid to rest as garbage dumps. Now archaeologists have come up with a new theory. To explain why there is so much trash buried with the dead, they say there was an earthquake 15 years before the eruption that decimated Pompeii. The eruption caused chaos and disorder and resulted in a lot of structures being broken. Since there was so much rubble and nowhere to put it, the citizens just started dumping it in the tombs. It's really shocking to see that even 2,000 years ago, when push came to shove, tombs also lost their sacred value and were used for more practical purposes. The Coyote Man From between 1400 and 1521, the Mesoamerican civilization known as the Tarascan dominated huge parts of western Mexico. During drainage work in the municipality of Tacambaro de Codayos, construction workers came across the statue of the Coyote Man. This just so happened to be the exact same place where in ancient times the Tarascan had built the amazing city of Tsinsunza. In the local language, the city name translates to Place of the Hummingbirds. The sculpture of the Coyote Man is nothing short of fascinating. It depicts a man-slash-coyote hybrid perched on a huge throne of basalt. It's only about three feet tall, but it's unlike anything else that's been excavated in the area. Other figures of a coyote man have been found, but they are usually quite small. This one is enormous. But the coyote man is a huge mystery. The very last rulers of Tsin Sun San called themselves the lineage of the eagle. They don't appear to have had much to do with coyotes at all. Yet there were some other large cities nearby, with one of them being Hiwatsio. This translates roughly to place of the coyotes, and it's been where most of the sculptures were discovered. Researchers believe that there may have been a totally separate dynasty or cult ruling the neighboring city who may have considered themselves to be descendants of the coyote. The Lady Scribe The skeleton of a woman from medieval times was discovered buried at a monastery complex in Germany in the city of Dalheim. Anita Radini from the University of York took an interest in the skeleton and did a full investigation. She discovered traces of the blue gemstone lapis lazuli in her teeth. What this means is that the woman most likely worked as an artist, licking her paintbrush or inhaling blue dust. This would happen if you were grinding the very expensive blue stones to create the blue pigment. During medieval times, this monastery, along with many others, was responsible for creating the beautiful illuminated manuscripts that took a high level of knowledge and skill to make. 
but it's been a long-held assumption that they were always written and painted by monks who were men, and women were not allowed. So how did a woman end up buried in a monastery with blue on her teeth? While nuns were involved with the church, they weren't usually allowed to do anything important, at least that we know of, because there isn't much documentation. Yet the discovery of blue on this woman's teeth suggests she was actually quite talented. The woman was somewhere between 45 and 60 when she died, with her bones being dated back to the 10th or 11th century. According to an expert on medieval scribes, Allison Beach, the only way someone could have gotten lapis lazuli on their dental tar would be if they were a highly skilled artist. This means that women religious artists could have been much more common than we thought. Much of the artwork still in circulation today could very well have been done by female scribes sitting in a monastery somewhere. Except it was then signed by a man to hide the truth. Viking Longhouses In Norway, archaeologists used ground-penetrating radar to detect five previously undiscovered longhouses. One of the buildings once stood 197 feet long, making it the largest known Viking longhouse anywhere in Scandinavia. The longhouses were found by the same team that discovered a Viking ship at the archaeological site of Gelestad in 2018. The buildings are all from the Iron Age, and are accompanied by several nearby burial mounds. If it hadn't been for the radar scans, the archaeologists would have never identified these amazing structures. Nobody knows what the longhouses were used for, but considering the shocking size of the biggest, this must have been a very important place. And because of its proximity to the huge burial ship found years before, archaeologists may have accidentally stumbled upon a secret Viking capital. This could have been one of the biggest and most important Viking settlements in Scandinavia, and yet nobody knows its name or why it was abandoned. It's a total mystery, one that archaeologists are still working very hard to solve. Stonehenge Celebrations The story of Stonehenge is one of the most remarkable and mysterious in all of Europe. It's undoubtedly the most enigmatic historical landmark in the world, built 4,500 years ago. This was a time of huge social change in Europe, as well as the beginning of technological advances that would bring us to where we are today. But nobody knows what Stonehenge was used for. There have been all kinds of theories and suggestions, but we simply don't know exactly. A new study in 2019 revealed that Stonehenge may have been used for mass gatherings. We already knew that it was probably used for strange rituals, but the study has revealed more specific details. Archaeologists examined 131 pig bones discovered at four Neolithic sites around Stonehenge. After extensive research and looking at old animal bones across all of Britain, the experts came to one conclusion. It seems people traveled from all over the UK and brought pigs with them. They then hunkered down near Stonehenge, within a 20-mile radius, at one of the multiple megalithic sites and butchered their pigs as part of a massive festival. Research has shown the pig bones found near Stonehenge are identical to pig bones that were raised locally in Scotland, West Wales, the northeast of England, and other regions of the British Isles. Dr. Richard Madgwick says this demonstrates a scale of movement and social complexity that nobody had previously believed possible. It doesn't solve the mystery once and for all, but it shows that Stonehenge truly was the center of ancient life here. If you could go back in time, would you attend the Great Gathering at Stonehenge? See how the pyramids were built? Or something else? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. Ancient Super Camel When archaeologists were working to restore a temple in Iraq that had been damaged by ISIS, they found something strange they uncovered evidence of an ancient hybrid camel. The discovery was made at the Temple of Alat from the 2nd century AD. It was once part of the great city of Hatra, capital of the Hatra Kingdom. Sadly, the remains were vandalized and destroyed between 2015 and 2017, and before that had been greatly neglected. Above a door at the temple was found a horizontal piece of stone artwork. It shows a monstrous ancient camel. But the picture of the camel is just one piece of the puzzle. 
Archaeologists have found other pieces of artwork to suggest that there was a crossbreed of camel found throughout much of the Middle East over 2,000 years ago. The hybrid camel is something of a mystery because researchers have been trying to figure out when experimentation began with mixed breeding. It seems to have been in the first century, when people took Bactrian camels from Central Asia with two humps and bred them with Arabian camels that only had one hump. The result was a beast of massive proportions. The animal was so impressive that it became sacred. Kings would have monopolies on breeding specific types of camels because they were so valuable. Camels were responsible for bringing merchants back and forth on the Silk Road, which back in the day meant big money. Stronger and more durable camels meant more and more money flowing faster and faster through trade. This made camels some of the most important animals of the ancient world. Horses were for war, but camels were for riches. Native American Trade Networks Archaeologists have always wondered just how extensive trade networks were between Native American tribes before Europeans arrived. Now, a research team of professionals from Binghamton University and State University of New York have made some interesting breakthroughs. They discovered a copper band from 3,500 years ago, buried with the cremated remains of seven people in Georgia. It was unique because until now, both copper and cremated remains were almost never found in the Southeast United States. At least not from between 3,000 to 8,000 years ago. Copper and cremated remains have, however, been discovered frequently in the Great Lakes region. That's nearly 1,000 miles away. The mystery presented to archaeologists is how a copper band made on almost the other side of the country wound up buried in a grave in coastal Georgia. Also, why were the dead cremated in the Great Lakes fashion instead of in the local fashion of just being buried? The theory is that there was an extensive trade network that went all across North America, connecting tribes and settlements. It was much vaster than experts have ever imagined, trading not only goods like copper, but also cultural practices like the cremation of the dead. The Golden Pendant Archaeologists were left holding on to their hats when a golden pendant depicting an Egyptian goddess was found in an unexpected place. The ancient piece of jewelry shows a depiction of the goddess Hathor, crafted in about 1500 BC. But it was uncovered very far from Egypt, in a Greek tomb in the ancient city of Pylos. Hathor can easily be identified by her huge crow-like ears. She was the goddess of the sky and of fertility. The pendant was uncovered in one of two underground tombs known as Tholos, which were excavated by archaeologists with the University of Cincinnati. They were looking for the remnants of an abandoned town that once surrounded the great palace of Nestor. They thought they might find workshops and houses, but instead, they found the tombs. And here's where things get mysterious. These tombs were uncovered very close to where a different burial site was found in 2015, known as the Griffin Warrior Grave. In this grave, archaeologists found all kinds of treasure, and even Minoan artwork that must have arrived via a trade network from the island of Crete. With this newest discovery of the Egyptian pendant, archaeologists are pretty sure the city of Pylos may have played a major role in the Mycenaean civilization. The Mycenaeans lasted from between 1650 to 1100 BC, originating from Mycenae in Greece. But with the discovery of so many foreign artifacts, it seems the city may have played a bigger role in sea trade than previously thought. It may even have boasted a surprisingly large population of people from foreign lands. The pendant was brought to the city by a native Egyptian maybe, someone who may have moved to a new kingdom in search of a better life. Tiny War Horses A team of archaeologists working closely with historians have discovered the mysterious truth behind ancient war horses. You know, the powerful stallions that once carried valiant knights into battle. We've all seen movies and TV shows showing knights in suits of armor storming across a battlefield on a great big steed. But after examining the bones of 2,000 horses from between the 4th and 17th centuries, that may be a bit of an exaggeration. Researchers looked at horse bones found in medieval cemeteries and other archaeological sites, including English castles. 
What they found is that medieval war horses were probably much smaller and daintier than the way we imagine them. They weren't hulks by any means, but more likely about the size of modern ponies. Professor Alan Outram from the University of Exeter says we need to throw away everything popular culture has tried to teach us when it comes to war horses. They were actually very small, so small that the person riding them probably would have been able to almost touch the ground. The horses used in war probably stood no taller than 4 feet 10 inches. Of course, there could have been larger ones, but the researchers never found any. It really makes you wonder just why the soldiers used horses at all if it didn't give them much of a tactical advantage, but they were able to move faster. On such short horses, they would have been easy targets for the other soldiers, so I guess it's a little give and take. Thanks for watching! Let me know your thoughts on these mysterious archaeological discoveries in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon! Bye!